Welcome to Conquering Your Clownfish, a podcast dedicated to transforming disabilities into special abilities. I'm your host, Brady Murray. Today is a monumental day because today is episode one of Conquering Your Clownfish. This is a episode, and this in fact is a podcast that has been in my mind for a very long time. It's something that I've discussed with many people, and it's been a long time coming. So I'm thankful to finally see the day here. Please allow me to introduce myself. My name is Brady Murray. I will be your host for Conquering Your Clownfish. Let me share a little bit about my background and why I felt inspired to start this podcast. I actually grew up in the budding metropolis of Preston, Idaho. Preston is a tiny little town in southeast Idaho. I'm thankful for my upbringing. I'm thankful for the opportunity that I had to see Preston and be part of Preston all throughout my childhood. And it's something that I go back to often to be able to visit. I currently reside in Highland, Utah, and uh, with my family, I've been married, happily married to the love of my life for 21 years. My wife's name is Andrea. She too grew up in a very small town just on the other side of the border of Preston, Idaho, in a town called Cove, Utah. For anybody that knows where Cove, Utah is, you get bonus points today. Um, We have been blessed to be able to have four amazing biological children, and we've also been blessed to be able to adopt seven amazing children as well. So yes, you counted that up right. You added it up right. We have 11 children, which is actually even a little bit weird in Utah. So I can share about uh, those kids all day long, but in fact, we're not going to spend too much time on that today um, about all 11. In fact, Andrea and I have actually been doing podcasting for a number of years now. We have a podcast that you may be interested in about adoption and about raising 11 children called See the Miracle. We have nearly 100 episodes on that podcast right now. So anybody who's curious about what it's like raising a family of 11, as well as the miracle of adoption, would encourage you to check that podcast out. Our children actually uh, that we have adopted are from China. We have one child from China, Cooper. We have two that we adopted through foster care, uh, Willow and Livy. And they uh, are from Colorado, actually. So they're from the United States. And then we most recently finished an adoption of four beautiful, amazing children from Colombia. So that's a little bit about our family. So the name of this podcast is Conquering Your Clownfish. And in every, every time I've shared with uh, those individuals that I uh, am considering doing a podcast, and, I, and they say, well, what's the name? What it's about? And I say, it's called Conquering Your Clownfish. They look at me and raise an eyebrow and say, that's interesting. Tell me more. So I'm sure you're probably doing the similar thing. Before I jump into exactly why this is called Conquering Your Clownfish, I think it's important that I share a very important point or a very important part of my life that has inspired the name of this, Conquering Your Clownfish. This story goes back to July of 2007, so a few years ago, 16 years ago to be exact, when Andrea and I were very close to welcoming our second child into our family and our first son. So our firstborn son, it was July, as I shared, and it was a record breaking hot July. It was crazy, crazy hot. Andrea was very, very, uh, pregnant and expecting our child that couldn't, he couldn't come soon enough. And on top of the heat and on top of the uncomfortableness that Andrea was experiencing with just being a few days away from Nash being welcomed into our family, we also were in the middle of a move. So. How that happened and why I chose to move our little family (laughs) just days before Dash was going to be born or we expected him to be born, I have no idea, but we went for it. So we were uh, just uh, barely out of college. Um, We definitely would still qualify as poor college students at this time in our lives. And we had actually been living in the basement of my in-laws, of Andrea's parents for a year in preparation to be able to move into a home that we were so thankful for and uh, thankful for Mike and Kayleen for letting us shack up in the basement. So the day came that the home was ready for us to be able to move in. And Andrea, as I shared, was very, very pregnant and expecting. And I encouraged her. I said, honey, please just let me do this. This is going to be a do-it-yourself with family and friends move. 
I borrowed a trailer, like, we'll get it figured out. You don't have to help us. But she helped us. And that's just Andrea for you. She's a go-getter and and she hates to see other people being put out or, you know, if there's work to be done, she's the first one that's going to volunteer to go and do that. So it took us all day. Our faces were beet red. We had sweat coming down our face the whole day. But thankfully with our friends and family and thankfully for the borrow trailer, the last box was moved in just about when it was getting too dark to see anyways. And so here we were in our first or in our home, our, our home that we just moved into uh, with our little daughter, Brinley. She had, she was already asleep and here we were just tons and tons of boxes and looking at each other and, and just saying, what an amazing blessing. What a special time in life. We're so thankful that we're in our home now and we can't wait to be able to welcome Nash into our family. And we really thought within the next week, Nash would show up. Sleep came quickly that night. Um, I remember clearly laying in bed and it was dark outside and I was beat tired. I just beat super, super tired. And I remember laying in bed, holding Andrea's hand um, and just thinking how blessed we are and what a special, special time of life that this was. As I went into a deep sleep, it seemed like only moments later that Andrea was was pushing me. In fact, she was like really trying to wake me up. And uh, I I came awake and I was dazed. And I actually didn't know where I was. And I, I wasn't sure exactly what was going on, but I remember clearly Andrea got my attention and she looked at me and she said, Brady, I think it's time. And she said it in a very calm voice, but I knew exactly what she was referring to. She was referring to it is time to go to the hospital because it was time for her to or for us to welcome our new baby into our family. I jumped out of bed. I mean, I my heart immediately went from zero to 100 in a second. And we were I was ready to go just immediately into like, let's go mode. And she kind of laughed at me and she said, honey, like I, I like take your time. Um, I've actually been having contractions for a little over an hour now. And I, I said, why did you not wake me up? And uh, she said, I just was actually hoping to get to um, get to at least the sun coming out and let you have a full night's rest because I know you worked so hard today. And that's just a perfect example of Andrea for you. She's a very, in fact, she is the most selfless person that I know and truly the love of my life. But she said, you know, they were contractions were getting a little bit closer and I figured I'd probably better wake you up. So I'm like, let's go. And she said, well, it's going to be a long day. Maybe go grab our bags and uh, make sure we've got everything and double check everything. And then, you know, we can go. So I went out into the front room, looking through boxes, trying to make sure we get everything that we need. A few minutes later, I come back into the room and I find Andrea in full-blown labor, labor pains, I should say, contractions right there on our bed. And she said those words at this time that no dad ever wants to hear. And that is, I think I waited too long to go to the hospital. I immediately jump into fix it mode. And I think to myself, I'm from Preston. I grew up in small town, Idaho. I've seen how this works. I mean, I have tons of friends that are farmers. I've seen cattle born. I've seen horses born. I can get this done. I sprint to the, to the garage. I am able to fortunately find my headlamp and my Leatherman. And I'm thinking, I'm going to deliver this kid and I can do this. Run into the bedroom and uh, <laughs> have that stuff there. Andrew takes one look at me and is like, what are you doing? Take me to the hospital. <laughs> and so thankfully, it was a hard contraction that she was feeling in the moment before. And that had passed and she was ready to get to that hospital. I picked her up literally picked her up, carried her to the car, set her gently into the passenger seat, called Richard. This was her grandfather who we love dearly. We miss him so much. He's since passed. But we called Richard and said, can you come and watch Brindley? And he said, I'll be there in five minutes. And we rushed to the hospital. We got there. We got Andrea all set up. I changed into my scrubs and was just ready for this moment. I had a video camera I had my cell phone there. I'm taking pictures. Like this was a super, super special moment. The labor went well, although I would say that it was more intense than I remember. Uh, Brindley, who actually was delivered C-section, 
And so Nash uh, was uh, delivered the good old fashioned way. And this was a new experience for me, actually much different than what I had seen on the farm. And it was quite intense. I was a nervous wreck. In fact, I think that the nurse and the doctor were probably a little bit more concerned about me than they were about Andrea (laughs) at that time. Definitely didn't want dad to pass out. Before I knew it though, and after an intense labor, Andrea, that Andrea did an amazing job. I saw my son for the first time and I will never forget that experience. I remember uh, looking at him and, and I remember hearing him crying. I remember looking at his fingers. I remember looking at his toes and I was counting and I'm like, 10 fingers, 10 toes. Everything looks good. He's great. We're good. And I was just in celebratory mode. I was so thankful. I remember they took him over and they were cleaning him up, watching. And I remember just having these visions and these ideas of what our life was going to be like together. And I could think of all of those mountains that we were going to climb. I could think of all the times that we were going to play baseball. And I could envision Nash playing in a state championship baseball team or a game for his his, uh, high school baseball team. I envisioned Nash going on and playing college baseball. I was going to do everything in my power to help this boy sing that song that he was meant to sing. I could envision a time when Nash would become a dad too. And uh, we would have a grandchild um, and that Nash would be married. It was, it was a tender, tender moment. You know, it's amazing how those, that imagery can just come instantly and be so readily available and so clear in such a sacred and precise moment. And so it was only a few minutes after Nash was born and after these images and these thoughts were coming to my mind that I noticed something. I actually noticed that the doctor and the nurses, so the pediatrician and the nurses that were tending to Nash were actually whispering back and forth and actually had a little bit of a concerned look on their face. I remember the nurses, um, would look at me, would glance at me. And then when I would make eye contact, they'd immediately look away. And it just, it just something didn't feel right. I remember them, I thought this was so strange, but I remember them pinching the, the skin, like pinching Nash's neck right here. And I remember them looking really close at his toes in particular, his his big toe. Like, like, why, what are they doing? And, And I always remember them looking at the palms of his hands. And I had no idea what they were doing. It was about 10 minutes after Nash was born um, that the doctor uh, finally broke away. And um, so this was actually the gynecologist uh, broke away. He was tending to Andrea and and broke away and came over to me and put his arm around me and walked me to a quiet place in the delivery room. And he uh, looked at me. I remember he had, um, had a serious look on his face and he had a quiet voice and a very humble voice. And he looked at me and he said, Brady, um, that was the first I had ever heard that. The thought never even crossed my mind that Nash could potentially be poor with something like Down syndrome. Um, I immediately became emotional. Um, tears just, just came streaming down my face. I remember hiding, um, my face from Andrea, who was, who was, behind me a ways um because i didn't want her to see me um because i wasn't i i was just processing um the doctor didn't say anything after that um he just comforted me like he's uh, dr heiner i will love him forever i'm so thankful for him and uh, being there in that unique time in my life and i uh i remember all of those images that just came to my mind before um I remember them banishing and thinking that, that that's, that's not happening. I'm trying to process what all this means. And then I got, uh, fearful because I knew individuals that had down syndrome, kind of, I mean like team or classmates and whatnot, but I never really knew them. I didn't, I didn't know what it meant. I just know they were, you know, just different from, from us and, and, uh, kind and nice, but just, you know, I didn't know what all this meant. I remember uh, really being fearful on 
for my son on what this meant to him. I remember being fearful on what this meant for my family, what this meant for me, um, what our future would look like. I mean, all of these emotions are just processing and going through me. And it was a very, very raw, raw feeling. It was an emotion, not of grief or, well, I mean, there was definitely some grief, but it wasn't an emotion of like sadness in the sense of like somebody had just passed away or you lost a, a, a child. But it definitely was also not a celebratory emotion by any means. It was just very much a raw emotion. And then I realized I have to go tell Andrea what that doctor just told me. And I was really afraid on how she would react. And I did not want to put this on her after she just went through delivery and had still not even held her little baby. I said a silent prayer in my mind. I gathered myself. I took a couple of deep breaths and I walked over to Andrea and I knelt down next to her and uh, just had those tears. And I was really not even able to talk for just a moment. And I remember Andrea grabbing my hand and she looked at me and she said, honey, what is wrong? And I took a deep breath and I whispered to her, honey, um, the doctor told me that they think that Nash has Down syndrome. And I watched, I watched her reaction. I remember that she was looking at me when I said that and she looked down and about as fast as she looked down, she looked back at me and she said, great, can I hold my son? And I knew in that moment that everything was going to be okay. I knew it. I could just tell from her reaction. I just felt a peace come over me and, uh, and I knew everything was going to be okay. Now, has there been challenges? Oh boy. Um, there has been challenges. And there has been a lot of emotion and, and there's been a lot of things that I've had to process and still to this day, 16 years later, um, and processing and learning and growing. But I did know in that moment that it was going to be okay. It doesn't mean it's going to be easy, but it, it means that it, I knew that it was going to be okay. I remember, um, after a few minutes, uh, I remember they brought Nash over and Andrea was holding Nash. I remember, uh, actually having an emotion, kind of a torn emotion where I felt like I needed to get ready right then. And so what I wish I would have done is just stayed in the moment and just stayed in the moment. But I felt like I needed to immediately start to prepare for what this meant for our life. And I needed to start to, I don't know if fix things or just make arrangements and get ready for what was going to transpire. I mean, this is within 20 minutes of Nash being born. I took my phone out, the old, good old Palm Trio. Everybody remembers that. And I Googled Down syndrome right there in the delivery room. And it pulled up and I clicked on it and I started to read. And what I read, no dad that just was told that his son has Down syndrome should be reading. I remember reading about congenital heart disease. I remember reading about um, high risk of Alzheimer's. I remember uh, low IQ, low muscle tone, um, challenges with hearing, challenges with vision. I remember reading all of this and here I am, you know, 20 minutes into this with my son and I'm trying to prepare and, and, and protect my son. I, in fact, that was an overriding feeling that I had is that I needed to protect my son. I needed to be a protector. I never wanted him to be bullied. I never wanted him to experience disappointment. I didn't want him to ever experience challenges because I just felt like I needed to protect him. That was a very, very overriding feeling. I also remember clearly thinking and feeling this fire within me. I've always been somebody that have enjoyed work. I'm a driven person when it comes to employment and, and trying to be gainfully employed. But I remember this fire being ignited within me that I had never felt to that degree before of wanting to be able to work so hard to make sure that we had enough money that Nash had everything that he needed from therapies to, um, any medical attention or any, any 
anything, anything that he needed, I wanted to be able to provide that for him. And these were deep-seated, strong emotions of protection and providing for my boy who um, I was just told has Down syndrome. In fact, that day, uh, it was within a couple of hours, our family came and, and we had called them and told them that, that about Nash and well, that he was here and that he has Down syndrome and, and everybody processed those emotions differently. But uh, our family came. I remember my dad and my sister were there. And, and uh, by this time, it was about lunchtime and I don't think I'd eat anything all day. And they said, hey, let's go to lunch and uh, let's get just get you some fresh air and let's let's just go for a bit. I said, that's probably a good idea. And we went to a restaurant that we really liked. And um, as we closed the car doors, we walked up to the restaurant. And as we're walking towards the restaurant, coming right out of the restaurant at the same time that we got to the front door was a couple that were definitely in their retirement years and, uh, you know, walked out of the restaurant and right behind them was uh, their daughter who I would guess was probably in her forties and clearly had Down syndrome. And that was a eye opening moment for me because it was then that I realized that Nash isn't going to move out when he's 18 and go to college. Uh, Nash is probably going to be with us for our entire life. And, uh, I remember thinking, what does that mean for us in relation to retirement and being empty nesters and traveling and serving in different um, service opportunities. Uh, what does that mean for us in relation to just our life that we've just been dreaming about the night before? And uh, that was a hard moment, definitely a hard moment. Uh, a lot, lot to gather, a lot to try and try and understand. Um, we went back and uh, everybody was there, and you know that was. Um, that was, that was a unique day. That was a special day. Um, I actually remember, I do remember that night, um, when we were finally into our room and it was just Andrea and I, and I remember holding Nash. That was the first time I really remember holding him and looking into his eyes. And I remember we were watching a baseball game. We were watching the Braves, uh, play and, uh, it's our favorite team and, uh, just really struggling really struggling as to uh, what our future may look look like. And I had peace. I knew it was right, but I definitely was struggling at that point in time. As I look back at the experience as a whole, I would say that um, it would be fair to say that was a traumatic day for me. Um, that, that, that created some trauma and uh, created a little bit of uniqueness uh, for me at that point in time. That really threw me into this, uh, this provide and protect mode for sure. And in fact, over the coming years, uh, so our, our kids, Brindley and Nash, uh, their favorite movie by far, uh, was Finding Nemo. And, um, shortly thereafter we moved up to Boise. So we were living in Logan, Utah. We moved up to Boise. It's like a four, maybe five hour drive. And all of our family was in Cash Valley. So we were living in Boise and we would make the trip back to Utah often. I mean, sometimes multiple times a month just to be with family and see family. And I remember all the time, the movie that we had to watch in the car was Finding Nemo. And so I had that thing memorized and, uh, I'd, I've seen it dozens of times, at least a dozen times, but I've heard it and listened to it dozens of times because you know how kids are when they get a favorite movie, that's the movie that they want to, want to be able to, uh, to, um, watch all the time. It wasn't until years later, I'm talking like 14 years later, that I realized what Finding Nemo was actually about. For the first 14 years, I thought it was a movie about um, a kid that gets lost, uh, dad goes to rescue him, and they have some funny experiences along the way, and you know, they are united. That's not what that movie's about. In my world, that movie is about me. And let me tell you why. I realized when Nash was 14, and I'll share with you the experience that really catapulted this, but I realized at 14 
that I was Marlin. Let me explain. Marlin is an overprotective father of a child that has a gimpy fin. You remember? Nemo has a gimpy fin. In fact, if you remember, the opening scene of Finding Nemo was Marlin and his wife on the edge of the reef overlooking this vast ocean. They chose specifically this place to be able to give their children, which the other scene shows they had a hundred eggs waiting for these children to arrive. They chose this place to be able to give these children an opportunity to conquer the world, to experience life to its fullest. This was full of adventure. That was Marlin and his, his wife's um, vision for their children. And then a barracuda showed up. The scene goes black. And the next scene shows, it's much darker now. The next scene shows Marlon there alone. His wife is gone. All of the little eggs are gone, except for one. It's fair to say that that was a traumatic experience for Marlon, that he had some things that he needed to deal with. The next scene shows Marlon with Nemo. Nemo now at the age of being able to go to school and Nemo can't wait to be able to go to school. He's full of life. He's full of energy. He is ready to go. And Marlon is having some issues with Nemo going to school. In fact, he's trying to talk him out of it and saying, hey, wouldn't it be safer if we just stayed here? Wouldn't it be better if we just waited another year before we need to go to school and do these things? And Nemo saying, absolutely not. I want to go and I want to try this. And then Marlon remembers or Marlon reminds him Nemo, don't you remember you have a gimpy fin, right? Be careful, you have a gimpy fin. In other words, you have a disability. Remember, you have a disability. Remember, you have a special need. You can't do this, or maybe you shouldn't be doing this right now. They actually go to school, um, and Marlon is introducing Nemo, and the first thing that he does when he introduces them is he introduces him as this is Nemo, and, and be aware that Nemo has a gimpy fin. So he's going to need to be protected. He's not going to be able to participate in everything that the other kids are going to be able to participate in. In fact, he tried to talk his son into staying and, um, and being able to uh, go to the nursery. That would be a lot more fun. That's what Marlon would choose if he was Nemo. And Nemo was just trying to like, dad, get off my back. I want to go and I want to do this. What I realized um, is that I actually have been Marlon. I understand why. I understand those deep-seated emotions and those deep-seated experiences that, um, that I had when I received the diagnosis of Down syndrome. But I am saying 100%, I know I was wrong. And so the purpose of this podcast is to help inspire individuals who are just like me, fathers, mothers, parents, siblings, loved ones, caretakers, Everyone entrusted with a loved one who has special abilities to be able to conquer our clownfish, our own clownfish, and be able to turn special needs into special abilities, into what it actually is, turning special needs into what it actually is, special abilities. And so I'd like to share now uh, an experience that I had that actually catapulted this uh, epiphany into my mind. It was when Nash turned 14 years old in our uh, local, uh, in our neighborhood, there's a local group of boys that uh, we get together and we have a weekly activity. And then on an annual basis, we have uh, what's called a high adventure. And this group in particular that I had helped serve and to help uh, be a part of was boys that are 14 and 15 years old. And every year we would go and do a like a legitimate high adventure, something pretty, pretty unique, pretty extreme and give these boys an experience. Well, Nash had turned 14 that year and we were planning a high adventure to be able to go into the Wind Rivers, into the back country of Wyoming, the Wind, Wind River uh, mountain range in Wyoming that uh, where we would backpack in and we would stay a number of days. We'd stay three or four days, if I'm not mistaken. I think four days we would be back there. We would, um, there's no electricity, there's no running water, there are no bathrooms. You are literally living out of your backpack in a, camp, in a camp in a very, very remote part of Wyoming. 
the area where I really wanted to go that year was right on the border of the tree line, well over um, 10,000 feet elevation, very little vegetation. In fact, it's a beautiful, beautiful area, tons of lakes, um, fishing like you would not believe. And I really wanted to give these boys an opportunity to go up there and just experience this, completely unplug and do something super hard. It was not easy. I had been there before. I knew it was not easy to get back in there. That's a long hike, multiple miles, like over 10 miles to be able to get to the place where we wanted to go. And we were going to gain a ton of elevation. And plus we were already at a super high elevation. And so as we were planning that at the beginning of that year for in August is when we were going to go, the question came up first by me of, is Nash going to go on this? And that was the question I asked myself. And I, my immediate thought was no, no, Nash isn't going to go on this, um, Nash, Nash, um, for a lot of reasons. Well, let's, let's be logical here. Number one, Nash wanders. And so we lose Nash occasionally. <laughs> Everybody who has a child with Down syndrome can appreciate that you lose your child occasionally. <laughs> no fault of your own, but you lose them. So we're in a wilderness country way back in the middle of the forest. That's crazy. We could lose Nash. Number two, physically, it's extremely demanding to be able to get up there and to be able to make it. I don't know if physically Nash could actually do that. Number three, is this really fair to the other boys? Um, would it detract from the experience of the other boys? Would it limit what we would actually be able to do when we are in the Wind Rivers to truly give them the high adventure that we had envisioned? Those were just a number, of, a few off the top of my head. And there was a number of different things that, that I could think of of why it didn't make sense for Nash to be able to go up there. I remember talking to Andrea about it. And, and Andrea was, you know, more in the lines of, but you decide, honey, like that's, that's up to you. You, this is your thing. I have reservations, but she was definitely not like a hard no by any means. And I thought that was interesting. I thought that was unique because normally she would be pretty much a hard no on that. I spoke with the other leaders and they were super supportive. I mean, they, they know like, this is your son. Um, but they did point out some of those things that I had just listed and they made note of that. And so Months went by and we had meetings and we had kids over and parents over and we showed them backpack stuff and here's how the food's going to work and this is how we're going to survive, how we're going to get clean water. It was just super fun preparing for it. And over and over and over in my mind, I continued to think, should Nash go on this? As the day got closer, when we got to July, we were only a matter of a month or so away. I knew in my heart, Nash was supposed to go on this. That did not mean that it was just like, okay, great. He's in. I just knew in my heart that Nash could do this and that it would require me to get out of my comfort zone. It would require me to conquer my own clownfish, stop being Marlin and get a lot uncomfortable in processing and understanding how exactly we were going to pull this off. So I went for it. I talked to Andrea about it. She said, 100%, absolutely, you can do this. I talked to the other leaders. They said, 100%, we'll support this, we'll do this. I talked to the boys. And this was a really special, special response. They were all in. I mean, all in. And these are a bunch of 14, 15-year-old boys who usually uh, they have you know, in their mind, the world evolves around them <laughs> and, and really there's nothing outside of them and their needs and what their focus is. And that's not at all how these boys reacted. They said, Brady, how can we help? How can we help Nash? And I said, well, let's talk about this. The day came, um, we loaded everything up. We drove a long ways all the way to Wyoming. We got to the trailhead and we put our packs on and we got ready to hike. These packs were heavy. Um, I had another boy, one, another one of my sons that was going with me, Ridge was planning on going with me. And, uh, you know, so I had to care. I'd bring, had to bring enough food for three people, um, sleeping bags, amenities, et cetera, for three people. And there's no way I was going to be able to carry all of that myself. And so 
there by requirement. I had to have help from Ridge and I also had to have help from Nash. And so we put a pack on Nash. We loaded it as heavy as we dared load it and we took off. Normally this, this hike is going to be around a four, four and a half hour hike. We got into this five hours and we still had a ways to go. Boys were tired. Nash was tired. And I was thinking to myself, are we going to make it? It has this been a good idea. And I experienced something in that moment when we were experiencing some, some fair, fair amount of adversity and maybe even a few tears, not by Nash, but maybe some of the other boys. Um, we experienced a little bit of tears, but Nash was definitely, um, lagging. Like he wasn't crying, but he was struggling. What I experienced is the older boys and some of those boys that are stronger boys rose to the occasion and they recognized that they needed to help these other boys. And in particular, they put in a special focus on Nash. I actually remember, and I have a picture of this, of a neighbor boy, Cedar, who's a strong boy, um, walking and holding Nash's hand, literally holding his hand on the trail and encouraging him and talking to him and encouraging him about um, being able to make it to the top and saying, you can do it, Nash, you can do it, buddy. And I just have that picture in my mind that, in fact, I have the actual picture of Cedar holding Nash's hand and encouraging him. In fact, I remember specifically Cedar saying, hey, if we make it to the top of uh, up to camp, I'm going to show you a picture of my sister because Nash has a little bit of a crush on his sister, which I thought was super, super cute. We made it to the camp finally, right as it was getting dark. I mean, it was just like du or, uh, dusk, yes, uh, when we made it there. And we frantically, I start pulling stuff out of the bags. I needed to get camp set up. And I remember Nash hauling into camp and he's got his pack and he sets it down and he puts his arms up and he flexes and he looks at me and says, I did it. I did it. And that was a super monumental moment uh, for Nash. In fact, we reflect back on that even years later when we're at the face of doing something hard or we have a hard thing we need to do. And I say, Nash, you remember you hiked to the top of that mountain in Wyoming and he grins and he says, yeah, I did that. I did it. And it's been a super awesome moment for us. We uh, went to bed. We had dinner. We went to bed. I got up the next morning or I woke up in the morning. Um, right as it was just barely getting light and we were right next to a lake and I could actually hear fish jumping. And so I love fishing. So I got up before everybody else in the tent and I got my, my fly rod and I went over and I started fishing and just started catching a ton of fish. It was awesome. But I remember as it was getting lighter, I could see camp and I was keeping an eye on it just cause I wanted to see when those boys were getting up in particular Nash. And I remember looking over, nobody was up. And then a few minutes later, I look over and I see Nash and he is naked, <laughs> like completely naked. And I think to myself, this can't be good. So I put the fly rod down. I run up to camp, get to him and I say, buddy, what's up? And he goes, I pooped. <laughs> I thought, where? And he said, in my sleeping bag, uh, that's not a good thing. So I take Nash down to the pond or down to the lake. We get him all cleaned up. I go assess the damage. Fortunately, it was a contained situation <laughs> and we were able to survive. The sleeping bag was actually fine. We cleaned out all the clothes. Everything was good. But I share that simply saying like, this wasn't just perfect. Like this, this was not easy. I had like, this was uncomfortable. We would have avoided this. The other boys didn't poop their pants in their sleeping bag when we were up there, but it was something that we experienced over the next number of days though. We also had some amazing experiences as we hiked, as we fished, we caught hundreds and hundreds of brook trout and cutthroat trout. We have amazing pictures and most importantly, we have amazing memories. We made it off the mountain uh, safely. There were no incidences. The boys truly rallied around Nash. He always had a buddy with him. They were always asking how they could help Nash. They truly went out of their way to make that a wonderful and special experience for Nash. When we got home, and as I was, in fact, on the drive back, reflecting back as the boys were just passed out in the truck and I'm driving and just pondering on this experience, that was the moment that I realized, my goodness, how much more could my boy have done had I had 
more of a mindset of allowing him to become who he's meant to become and stop being a clownfish. And I reflected back on the Finding Nemo movie and I thought that literally that movie is, is me. I am Marlin. Like I have to stop doing that because this boy is so much more capable than I'm giving him opportunity to be. And I remember thinking that I am going to change from this moment forward. I am going to change. And throughout the podcast, I'll share other experiences where honestly, I continue to fight it even still to this day, or I catch myself falling into Marlin mode, even to this day. That was a special moment in realizing that my boy is capable of so much more. The other thing that I realized in that moment is yes, this was a good experience for me. I learned a lot. Yes, this was a good experience for Nash. He, in his own mind, realized that he too is capable of so much more. But I would submit to you now, having talked to those boys even years later about what they remember most about that experience, I would submit that the most impact that was done was not on me, was not on Nash, but was actually on those boys. And the opportunity that this presented to them to be able to get outside themselves and get caught up in a cause that was bigger than themselves. And by so doing, they felt, and they still to this day feel, a deep love, a deep charity for Nash. And that is what I refer to as the special ability. The world calls our children special needs. They call them disabled. Well, let me share. My experience with Nash has been far from somebody who is disabled, far from somebody who has special needs. Sure, Nash will probably not drive a car. Sure, Nash is probably not going to pass a college math class. But where it really counts, where it matters the most in being able to be kind and loving and help other people become who they're supposed to become, in and through the service of other people, Nash has a very, very special ability. And I know from firsthand experience, this is not exclusive to Nash. And I would also say this is not exclusive to Down syndrome. Each of our loved ones in their own special way has an ability to allow us to be able to become who we're meant to be, to become our best selves when we give them the opportunity to be able to do so and allow them to get outside of their comfort zone. And so a quote that I have that I love more than anything is uh, this quote. It says, what one can be, one must be. And that's what I believe our responsibility is as caretakers of parents, of family, of, of individuals entrusted with this special ability. It's up to us to help them, to empower them, to be able to sing that song that they are meant to sing. And that is the purpose of this podcast. On this podcast, I'll be sharing personal experiences of struggling with being Marlin and how I'm able to overcome those. And even more importantly, and what I'm most excited about is we're going to be having very special guests of parents and caretakers and family members of loved ones entrusted with special abilities and how they have been able to overcome and conquer their clownfish and ultimately allow their loved one to be able to rise up and sing that song they're meant to sing, ultimately to realize and utilize that special gift, that special ability that each one of them have. I'm excited to go on this journey together with you. Thank you for listening and thank you for being a part of this. If you feel so inspired, would love to have you share this podcast subscribe, and also give us a great rating because we more than anything want to get this in as many people's hands as we can to help share this message. Have a wonderful day. Thanks for listening to this episode of Conquering Your Clownfish. If you liked what we discussed on the podcast today and want to continue the conversation, please visit us at conqueringyourclownfish.com. And please don't forget to subscribe. <laughs>